I absolutely, up to that point, knew exactly where we were in utmost confidence. Never traveled here before, so it's like, yeah, I got this, I know where I'm doing, I know where, where we're going, and boom, 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 boom. This marker shows up, and it just threw me for an absolute loop. Cold day as we sit here at the end of April of 2019 still wait for Boogaboo to be launched uh, still a couple weeks away from that but I was hoping to get to the boat this weekend to do some preliminary pre-launch work but as I mentioned it's cold out we woke up to actually snow this morning if you can believe it today is the 27th of April 2019 and so yeah some late April snow not a lot of I mean, it's all melted away now but still it, cold enough that it's cold <laughs> and also you can probably hear in my voice that I am suffering from a bit of a cold myself uh, last couple of days yesterday was uh, kind of brutal but I seem to be getting over it a little bit so I took advantage of a day off shall we say it's a Saturday so I'm not working today anyways um, I was looking at the charts in anticipation of our upcoming epic adventure for 2019, which will absolutely be Georgian Bay. We have not been to Georgian Bay since 2015, now it's 2019, so that's five seasons ago, four years ago. Yeah, the time certainly flies, and I am so eager to get back up to Georgian Bay and do some serious cruising um, well beyond where we've gone in the past. So with that in mind, I dug out the old charts, I've got my ports cruising guide <coughs> out, and I was referencing that. I was even online uh, with the Navionics web app and, and really studying the charts. Now, uh, Navionics, we'll, we're gonna get back to that in the future. I wanna give a big overview of how that, uh, how that app works and, and the benefits of it. But anyways, I digress, as always. Let's get back to the charts. So the, the, the thing that I want to show you on the charts comes from personal experience. Now I know a lot of folks don't use or believe in paper charts anymore. As a matter of fact, I believe it was just this past year that the Canadian Coast Guard, maybe the American Coast Guard, but anyways, one of the Coast Guards uh, no longer require paper charts aboard ships. So um, it's a little bit of a... Um, a thing of the past, I still like having paper charts. To me, it's just something not only to refer to in an emergency, you know, if your electrons go down or your apps die, whatever it is, you have the paper charts. But not only that, I love to study the charts ahead of whatever journey that we're gonna take. Anytime that we have traveled to new areas in the past, I've always had the paper charts and you know, a couple of days or the day before we actually leave wherever we are at and going to another place, I, I take out the paper charts and I study them and I try to give myself a heads up of what's going to be there. Because yes, the electronic charts, you know, a chart plotter or something like I mentioned earlier, the Navionics app, they're great to have and, you know, they're always there and they're moving along as you move, you know, through the course. But the paper charts, I don't know, it just, like I say, it, it's something to have in front of you or at least something to study ahead of time so you know where you're going and what, what's, what's what. My story relates to the first time that Anchor Girl and I went to Georgian Bay. Now for, for those of you who are not familiar with Georgian Bay, Georgian Bay is a bay on Lake Huron, one of the great lakes here in uh, Canada, North America. Uh, Georgian Bay itself particularly the 30,000 Islands is massive and the 30,000 Islands beyond being very very picturesque and you know has been uh, reported as the best freshwater boating in the world by many many people uh, ourselves included it can be somewhat intimidating and also treacherous if the winds are against you whatever now I don't want to dissuade anybody from going to Georgia Bay I highly recommend it and 
that's why I want to go there again this year is because I want to share the beauty with you so much more than we've done in the past. I'm going to leave a couple links down in the, well, I'm going to leave a link down in the description to my uh, cruise in Georgian Bay um, YouTube playlist. And I think there's something around 60 or 70 videos in that playlist, all my own creations, of course. But we've only gotten as far as just a little bit beyond Perry Sound. So getting back to the first time that Anchor Girl and I went there, uh, explored Georgian Bay, we did it all on our own. I was so proud that we were able to get to where we got to and back on our own because many, many people, many, many boaters won't do Georgian Bay unless they're following somebody who's been there in the past. Um, you may say that that's prudent because there are a lot of hazards and there's a lot of horror stories on Georgian Bay, but again, don't, don't let that dissuade you from, from visiting there. I highly recommend everybody should see it. Like I say, most folks will go up following somebody who's been there before, like a boating buddy, and it's like, yeah, I've done Georgia Bay, and we'll, you know, I'll take you to wherever, and we're gonna anchor, it's gonna be a great time, which is awesome, it's fantastic. But like I say, we did it on our own, we got as far as Perry Sound and back on our own. Again, getting back to this one particular situation, which I, I, I think and I, I hope, whether you're using paper charts or electronic charge, charts should help you. So pay attention. <laughs> Now, before I go any farther, I'm just gonna share with you, I think I mentioned this once before in a video years ago already, something that is called Chart One, which is uh, issued by the Canadian Hydrographic Service, which is part of Fisheries, Fisher, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Federal Government of Canada, and they are responsible for producing all of the charts that we rely on throughout Canada. Now, um, chart one is available. I think I paid about six bucks for this and ordered it online. But there is also an electronic version in a PDF file format online on their website. And I'm going to leave a link in the description and you can check it out if you like. Now, this thing is a cornucopia of awesome information. Now, what could be in this book that it makes it so valuable that every boater should study? Whether you follow Canadian, hydro, high, Canadian hydrographic charts or the US charts, I'm sure there's something uh, that the American, it's NOAA, right? The National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, I'm pretty sure I should have looked this up before I did this, that is responsible for the charts in the United States waters. Um, but this gives you a breakdown and a clear understanding and description of all of the symbols, all the abbreviations, and everything that you need to know that is listed on all of the Canadian hydrographic charts. That's a hard word to spit out. Um, Throw Canada. So, of course, there's a lot of information here. There's a lot of stuff that it does not necessarily apply to the boating waters that we apply or that you may. But again, there's a lot of neat things that you're just going through and it's like, you know what, I never even noticed that that on the chart. And this is, what I, this is the crux of what I'm trying to impart to you on this video. When we went to Georgia Bay the first time, we went from the Trent Sermon Waterway, Block 45, Port 7, where, where you guys have all seen, uh, to Midland Harbor, which I took you to last year on the Epic 2018 boat cruise, uh, and then went up to Henry's, Taking to you in the past, and now to uh, Perry Sound, Big Sound Marina, which I've never shared uh, with a video, but I'm going to this year for sure. So those uh, one, two, three legs of the journey were pretty simple, you know, paying attention because it's it's a different world of boating in Georgia Bay than what I've shared with you in uh, our let's say our local waters of the Trent Severn Waterway. Trent Severn Waterway is very uh, contain and it's you know you're always within sight of land and it's it's really hard to get off of the main small craft route main uh, the the main course that you have to follow um, it was probably a, like the second time we we've done the whole 240 miles of the system it was probably the first two times that we travel in any area I had the paper charts in front of me and after that it's like like yeah whatever there's a green mark and a red mark as long as you know if you're going upstream or downstream that's the thing to keep in mind however on gorgeous Georgian Bay, it's very different, especially the 30,000 islands, because um, just the, the terrain of 
of the waterway that's very, very rocky. Um, depths change very rapidly and there's um, more hazards to keep an eye out for. But again, if you follow the charts, the main small craft route is very well marked, but you have to be on your game. You have to pay attention to what you're doing. So, like I say, heading out each day, I always made sure to, to study the charts ahead of time, just so I had an idea of where I was going. Now, on this particular day, we left Henry's, world famous Henry's Fish and Chips restaurant. And we were going from there to Perry Sound, which again, driving slow was maybe a two hour drive. And very simple because we were going mostly kind of inland protected waters through uh, what's called South Channel. Um, but there is a spot where one has to veer off the main small craft route and take a side route uh, to Perry Sound. And it's very well marked on the charts and it's all there and I studied and I knew exactly where I had to make my turn. I had my paper charts in front of me. I had my chart plotter going in front of me, our old uh, standard horizon, or I think it was a six inch or seven inch screen. Thing worked fantastic. Paper charts were there. Depth sounder was on, which is also a good um, instrument to have going. So, because like I said, the, the depths change quite rapidly. Uh, on Georgian Bay. So if you're looking at the charts and you're going, for example here, we're in 107 feet of water, but if I go over that way a little bit, we're in only 47 feet of water. That's a hell of a change in elevation down below. So if you've got the chart plotter, or sorry, if you have that depth sounder in front of you as well, that's, that's a good reference to have. So paper charts, chart plotter, depth sounder. Studied ahead of time, I know exactly where I am and I know exactly where I'm gonna make my turn until I made that turn. All of a sudden, there was a, a, a buoy in the water that I totally was not ready for, did not expect, did not know it was there. So what did I do? I stopped the boat. I pulled it right back, neutral, and now we're drifting. Anchor go, what's, what's going on? I said, uh, I don't know where I was. I absolutely, up to that point, knew exactly where we were in utmost confidence. Never traveled here before, so it's like, yeah, I got this, I know what I'm doing. I know where, where we're going and boom, 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 boom. This marker shows up and it just threw me for an absolute loop. What this marker was, was a bifur, bifur, bifurcation buoy. And I believe I showed you these in the past and what they are, are either red, green, red, or green, red, green. And what they indicate is a split in the channel. So, if you are heading upstream, of course it's red, right, return, so, your red markers will always be to the starboard side, to the right side as, you, as you're heading upstream. And so if you hit a bifur bifurcation buoy, which is red, green, red, that means you can split off, but the main route will keep, you keep that to the right. So here's the, the marker and you go like this. So it's red, green, red. So you can either go behind it or the main preferred main small craft route, you're going to keep that to your right because it's right on the top so you go like this. Simple enough. We have them here on the Trent Seven Waterway. I've seen them. I know what they do and I know why they're there. But this blew me away and it's like, hold on a second. I did not see that on the paper chart. I did not see it on the chart planner. Clearly I wear glasses. These glasses are for distance. So standing up at the helm, I'm looking down at the chart. It's like, I don't see that marker. I'm looking at the chart plotter, I don't see it, so I take off my glasses, I'm looking down into the, uh, uh, onto the chart plotter, it's like, yeah, okay, I see that. And now I'm looking onto the, the paper charts, which like I say, I studied before, let's just back up a second. I knew I had to make a turn right here at Turning Island, aptly named. And so, yes, when we leave Henry's, which is just down this way, I ain't gonna hit, uh, boom, Turning Island, and that's when it veers off the main small craft route to the side route, and that's where I'm gonna make my turn. Well, lo and behold, that little marker, that bifurcation buoy, is on the charts. Why wouldn't it be, right? However, the problem is that how it's marked on the charts, the red ones are marked as red on the charts, and the green ones are marked as black. Don't know why they do that, but I guess just to give that high contrast. Whereas these little buggers, they're just a little black outline. And driving and staring at it like that, if you're not, you know, expecting it to be there, 
It doesn't exist. So I saw it on paper charts, identified it, looked on the on the on chart plotter. Okay, all right, it's a bifurcation book. I get it. <laughs> Meanwhile, all the while, there is a trawler behind us, a, a local trawler. A trawler, I don't think he was doing the, the loop, but clearly he was wanting to keep going on the main small craft route. And he did, as uh, many new boaters to Georgia Bay, and I think he would have been a new one, he stopped. So when I stopped, he just pulled it back. Now we're drifting like this in Georgia Bay, and it was a cloud. It was not the best conditions, not bright and sunny because he, because he could see everything. So he stopped dead in the water. I'm stopped dead in the water trying to figure out where the hell I am, even though I knew where I was. I had no idea at that point where I was. Um, so he stopped too. And I was like, all right, so I got on the radio on 60 and I said, you know, trawler behind me on the 30 foot red top cruiser in front of you. Um, it's all good. I'm just trying to figure out which way I want to go, kind of cover myself. And, um, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're good to pass me if you want. Well, he waited until we carried on before he went on, even though there's lots of wide water. He could have done whatever he wanted there. But um, that was humorous in that respect. So once we had stopped, at our destination of the night, which uh, for the day, which was like say Perry Sound, uh, Big Sound Marina. I got looking at these charts a lot closer, and when we got home, I don't think I did it when we were there, but when we got home, I took out all my charts from Georgia Bay, and I started to make some annotations on the paper charts. Now, I didn't make any notes, but what I did do was highlight bifurcation buoys, in orange because like I say the reds are marked as red the greens are black and so I took the bifurcation boys I got uh, these highlighter markers made that orange and then Georgian Bay has lots and lots of day, day beacons which are markers are not uh, lateral boys that are floating in the water but they're uh, permanently fixed to ground to, to land either onshore or just offshore and in Georgian Bay, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, so you gotta keep your eye out for that. Um, at a distance, many of them look similar, but all you have to do is keep in mind, which I mentioned before a couple of times in my videos, the reds are the pointy ones, and the greens are flat, so the onshore ones will be pointy or flat top, and you just, you have to kind of get with that. And that's why I say Georgian Bay, from uh, our local waters is a little bit different and uh, for the first time going up there you have to kind of pick up on these things I know the first time we went up there was nobody on YouTube who was sharing this information um, I'm sure there was probably forums or whatever that I could look up online to read up on it but I just I don't do that so it was a learning curve but again, when you're out on your own in the open, there's no other boats around, and you know, like it, you know, you don't want to end up on the rocks and just be another statistics and a bad story in Georgia Bay. So we were learning as we were going, and so, like I say, what I did was to mark on the paper charts all of these symbols that don't necessarily jump out on the paper of the charts as to what they signify. So I did a little bit of learning and I took my time and I marked the day beacons on shore, which again are sometimes not that uh, hard or easy to see. The red ones are because they're marked in red, but the green ones are just basically a square box with a square dot on the inside, right? Because the greens are flat. And so I took some green highlight and I highlighted all the day beacons on shore as well. So, like I say, at a glance, I could see that even wearing my polarized sunglasses, that highlight, that bright green highlight would show, uh, stand out. Now, the other thing that I did was mark onshore other um, aids na navigation that are marked on the charts. For example, flag poles and flag staffs. I'll get back to that in a second. And then if there are uh, radio towers or whatever. There's enough stuff on the charts which doesn't necessarily show you what to avoid uh, sorry, avoid or what you have to look out for, but they are again, their aids to navigation because if you're looking at the chart and you're kind of like, yeah, I know we got to go that way. Georgian Bay isn't like just a straight one run. So there's, <laughs> again, in the words of Anchor Girl, it's rocks and trees. 
lots of rocks and trees and there's many areas where there's no cottages or you know structures on, on, on land to help you define where things are but in the distance further inland maybe there may be a tall flagpole or a, um, a cell tower and, and stuff of that ilk and they will they if they're conspicuous from water they will be marked on the charts so as you're driving along and you say oh yeah I can see that pole way off in the distance I'm gonna look at my chart yeah right on okay it's about yeah 90 degrees to our current position and so I get that so that helps you find your place in the world <laughs> yes okay so flag poles and flag staffs to the uninitiated you're driving along in the boat boom boom oh there's a flag pole there's a flag pole there's a flag pole Yes and no. Whether there's a flag flying on that pole or not, they're not necessarily all flagpoles. And again, on the charts, a flagpole is just, it looks like a flagpole. It's like a stick with like a wavy flag and the symbol. And the other ones are, they don't look like a flag at all. They're just a, if I believe, I remember, just a dot. Yes, they are. A round circle with a dot in the middle, and it says FS, and that's a flag staff. Again, to the naked eye, to the layman, oh, it's a flagpole. So what is the difference between a flagpole and a flagstaff? Well, I love to do these casual observations on my own, that even looking up a, a different book of a reference. And the only difference between a flagstaff, flagpole and a flagstaff, a flagpole is a permanent flag, a pole, right? That you put a flag, you put the flag down, whereas a flagstaff, and I'm sure you're going to see it even just driving on the streets, especially in uh, older towns or country roads. A flag staff is a pole that has, there's two poles set in the ground and the actual flag pole in the middle can pivot down and up like that. That's a flag staff. So I think they did that back in the old days where it was a lot easier just to pivot that pole down to replace the flag, you know, take it off at night or put it up in the morning and then boop, put it back in. I'm sure there's a locking pin in the bottom. That's a flag staff as opposed to a flag pole. Like I say, real simple and you would never know. It's one of these things you don't know unless you know, right? But when you're traveling on Georgian Bay, it is, I wouldn't say imperative, but it is helpful to know the difference between a flag pole and a flag staff. And again, these little things that you know ahead of time or as you go along, a book like this, or at least referencing to the website, and again I'll mention, or sorry, I will leave a link to the, the Canada Fisheries website where you can download the PDF, you can look at it yourself, study it, or save it on your mobile phone or whatever. Go through it. This book itself, the printed thing is 120 pages. Now just quickly as a very interesting bit of information, where we were last year in uh, in Midland, that's Midland Harbor, and there's a giant grain elevator with, a, with North America's largest outdoor mural, or at least it was back in the day when it was created. And there are ships that come in there and they offload grain and do whatever they do. And there's some boats that they go there even in the winter and then they get stuck because it gets all full of ice. And so just a few weeks ago, I heard on the radio and I just, I couldn't believe it, but yes, I followed up with uh, looking into um, uh, the Coast Guard, Canadian Coast Guard, they have icebreakers that go down there to help, you know, make a channel for these guys to get in and out. Well, the icebreakers were stuck just beyond uh, Midland Harbor, just to the north. Uh, there's an island called Hope Island. And between Hope Island and the mainland, they had ice ridges, believe it or not, of 20 feet thick ice. And that's why I heard on the race, like, at first it was, wow, 20 feet thick ice, that's crazy. And then it's like, there's no way they got 20 feet of ice. Lake Simcoe here, which is a big body of water, it gets five feet of ice on a really, really cold winter. 20 feet? Anyways, yes, I looked up and it did 20 feet of ice. And the icebreaker, and they had a big icebreaker there. Actually, US Coast Guard sent a couple of their small icebreakers down and it wasn't happening. So they had to send a big one from Montreal or something. It came through. And this thing was having a tough go of 20 feet of ice. But, whatever, um, <laughs> this is life in Ontario. So like I say, I hope you uh, get a little bit of something out of that, a little bit of knowledge and how, why I think paper charts are still important, even if you're not going to use them all the time. Now, 
getting back to the Georgian Bay charts, uh, when we left on our Epic 2018 boat cruise last year, uh, we didn't have any real set plan as to where we were going to go. Uh, so we were hoping to, we had expected to only stay within the Trent Severn waterway. And as I mentioned, very familiar water, so I don't need the paper charts with me because I know uh, the spots where I should avoid hitting the bottom, which I've done in the past. So when we headed up to Georgian Bay, I said to myself, Self, you dummy, you have all these charts, but where are they? They were at home. So I said, I'm going to buy myself uh, a set of charts, which I did. So these have become redundant to me. And this is again chart 2022, which will take one from Port Severn, around Lock 45, Midland area, the south end of the 30,000 Islands, Georgian Bay, southeast and up to Perry Sound, and there are five sheets, if I recall, yes, five sheets, which will actually, the sheet five, will actually take you up to the Moon Islands. Beautiful anchorages up there. And this is what I had on board Boogaboo uh, this past summer. So since these are redundant, and I don't need them anymore because I've got all these other paper charts to store and stow away, I'm gonna be giving these away. So I hope you've been able to <laughs> make it through to the end of this video because I got another giveaway. Now these charts, my friends, are the actual charts that were on Boogaboo and went across Midland Harbor and uh, Severn Sound last year on Boogaboo. So what I'm doing is I am going to place them into this beautiful chart bag, which was uh, graciously contributed through Craig at Canadian Yacht Tops. You've seen these things before. And I'm gonna give this away. So, real simple. Um, I don't wanna do a random draw and all that stuff because it's just too painful and it takes too much of my time. So, what I'm gonna do, my friends, I'm gonna leave it up to you. If you wanna win these charts, and like I say, I hope you can, you will only enter this if you really think that you could use them, you'll need them, and even if you're gonna do this year, next year, whatever, but that you would plan to actually go on to Georgia Bay, use the charts, you don't have the charts yourself. Um, just simply leave me a comment, leave a comment for everybody to read, and just say why. Give me a heartfelt, honest, comical if you want, reason why you should win these charts. And I will send them off to you. And I'm gonna kind of leave it to everybody, including me. I'm gonna. If there's not one that really jumps out, I'm gonna leave it to everybody else to, uh, to vote on. So, yeah. So how about the comment that gets the most likes from all you guys by, what's today, like say April 27th? Let's say May 15th and around there. Yeah, yeah, let's say by May 15th. Leave your comment why you think you are worthy of these charts and why you think you should win them and why you, uh, how you're gonna use them. And I'll leave it to everybody else. The one that has the most likes on that comment is the winner by May 15th. All right, so best of luck for that. You'll enjoy it. And again, thanks to Craig from Canadian Yacht Tops providing, for providing this beautiful chart bag. And this is kind of the one that I want to keep for Boogaboo because it matches our canvas color, so I guess I gotta get another one off of him. So that's that. Okay, Georgian Bay uh, 2019, that is going to be our focus and I am so looking forward to it. The more I look at the charts, the more I look online of you know, potential places to go and on and on and on, uh, I'm, I'm getting really, really motivated and actually looking at new camera equipment to make it even more beautiful because yeah, it's gonna be a great series again. So like I say, thanks for following. Best of luck to any of you who want to enter this. Please, only those of you who can actually use this, enter. Um, yeah, it's going to be another great boating season. Hopefully by then my cold will be gone. <laughs> Alright, that's it for now. Cheers. Thanks for watching. Hope you'll subscribe so you don't miss any of the new boating videos coming up. I also post daily on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, so check that out to get your daily boating fix. Head on over to my online store where you can find shirts, caps, mugs, and a whole lot more. 
course, all the links can be found down in the description or click on over to BoatingWithBoogaboo.com. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next Boating with Boogaboo adventure. Cheers! <laughs>